Welcome to The Dental Brief, the world's direct, right-to-the-point podcast produced to get you the information you need to learn and grow your practice. To learn more about our guests and find links to information discussed on our show, visit our website, dentalbrief.com. On to today's episode. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of The Dental Brief. Today, I have coming live from Oregon, Melissa Turner. Melissa, say hello. What is up, Patrick? Hello, everyone. Hey, we're so happy to have you here. Um, it's going to be a really fun episode. We got to chat a little bit before we got started. Um, I know you're with the Seller and Consulting Group, but I want I want you to start off by telling us um, how you got into dentistry. How did you become a hygienist? Oh, boy. Well, this was back in the day, you know, when, when people would look in the newspaper for, for job ads. I don't know, Patrick, are you old enough to, <laughs> to know that? I am. I'm younger than you, for sure. Right, right. I got out of high school and I was like, sure, I'm going to college, but what the heck do I want to do in the meantime? And there, some of the local dental offices were advertising for dental assistants. And so that was my first introduction to dentistry. Um, and 16, 17, 18 years later, I've been a hygienist for a while, spent my entire adult life in people's mouths, which is somewhat gross and somewhat glamorous at the same time, but I love it. I love it. I'm a nerd like that, right? So what, tell me, what did you love about being a hygienist and what did you dislike about it? You know what? Clinical hygiene, I I think hygienists and, and healthcare providers in general are, somewhat givers and empathetic folks and they they want the best for those around them and i think you know it just felt good to have a safe place to land in a career and that's exactly what hygiene is you take care of the patient and they're sitting in your laps you know as close as you can get to them which can be awkward at times right but it's this it's this vulnerability that happens that you're in their mouth and they don't like it you're trying to talk to them but there's this connection that happens And if you can, if you have the time during an appointment, the conversations that happen between a dental hygienist and their patient, they're magnificent. I mean, they are so wonderful and it's all about connection. I mean, especially after the year that we've been through where where we haven't been able to connect in person with anyone. For some people, this is the first time that they're getting within another person's COVID bubble, you know, when they go to the dental office and get their teeth cleaned. Yeah, I think this is probably a year that um, people being happy to go to the dentist is at an all time high. I honestly think when things open back up here in Colorado and other parts of the countries and people are just overwhelmed with everybody wanting to come in, I think it was because they're like, oh, it's something I can do. Mm-hmm. Right. It's uh, It'll be fun. I can go see some people and talk to some people and it'll be really fun. What 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 did you like least about being practicing as a hygienist? Oh, practicing as a hygienist. There's dentistry, and we can get into this later. But dentistry is very traditional, and so as as a as an industry, um, typically dental hygienists when they graduate from hygiene school, they reach that glass ceiling right away, and there's nowhere to go. There's nowhere to to grow in your career unless you want to be an educator or something like that. And so I feel very fortunate in my in my career right now. I I am kind of a jack of all trades. I I have. I've got young kids at home, so I don't do much clinical work, but I'm an advisor. I'm a consultant. I speak, I write, and and I'm a business owner too. So I've been able to break out of that traditional, um, clinical, traditional mindset for hygiene. And I, that's hard for a lot of people to do. You know, Some people can't take risks. Some people don't have the energy to break out of a clinical role. Um, but I, I feel fortunate because I've, I've been able to over the last several years. And it's, it's been great. It's, it's been an amazing thing. And so, I, um, Melissa, as you know, we always talk about challenges that dentists have and, and or practices have or any anyone on the team, hygienist, office manager, it doesn't matter what the position is or what their role is. And of course, I want to do that today. But to frame that, um, tell us more about what you're doing now, kind of what's your passion and what's got you excited and what are you working on right now? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So over the last couple of years, I've been able to um, start a few businesses in dentistry. One is the National Mobile and Teledentistry Conference. And then we have a sister organization, a nonprofit um, professional association that goes with that community. Um, I am chief hygiene officer for Celerant Consulting. We are an incubator and accelerator for dental brands. Um, I'm probably the only one in dentistry at this point. Um, and I am also the co-founder of the Denobi Awards, which is a brand new awards program that we launched this year. And it's like the dental Oscars. We just had our first awards gala last month in Orlando. 
Um, it was a hybrid. Some people were there in person. Some people were viewing live stream from home, but we were dressed out to the nines. We were celebrating uh, these award winners um, from all over the country and all over walk uh, from from all walks and and backgrounds in dentistry. And that was that was a very important important moment, I think, for dentistry to kind of get back on its feet and, and, um, you know, kind of put COVID behind us um, to have an in-person event. So, so that's kind of what I'm about. I, I also just launched a new, um, a new network, which has been uh, a couple of years in the making. It's called I Heart Dentistry. And so probably about five or six years ago, I started a Facebook group called I Heart Mobile Dentistry. And this was pr the precursor to the conference and the association that, that we have now today. Um, but what I saw was we had these, these dental clinicians who were delivering health care all across you know, the country, and it was a long and lonely path. They weren't really supported in dentistry. They didn't have any communities to come to, to talk together. They were all fragmented and it was, it was lonely for a lot of them. And so I started this Facebook group and it grew into a movement and it grew into this amazing supportive community of, of, I like to say some of the misfits in dentistry who are, who are the pioneers who are taking mobile, mobile care to the patient. And so that was kind of the, the beta test per se of, of I Heart Dentistry. So just a couple of weeks ago, we launched a series of Facebook groups to support other underrecognized dental professionals. So for instance, we have a Facebook group now for LGBTQ plus dental professionals. We have one uh, for parents. We have one for vegans. We have one for hard of hearing dental professionals because so many of us are hard of hearing. We just don't talk about it a lot. Sure. Um, for spiritual, for, you know, BIPOC and Latinx and the list goes on and on. Oh, and for my favorite, I think my favorite is we have, we now have a community for inked dental professionals. So it's, it's one of these things. A lot of times in dentistry, uh, dental professionals are kind of shamed if they have a tattoo or a, a visible facial piercing or something like that. And now we have some place to go where we can um, commune together and, and support one another. So you're going to have to keep a track of that group and find any dental related tattoos and throw them on there. I'd love to see some of there those. There we go. Yeah. Yeah. It'd be funny. So all those came from answering an ad, right? In the newspaper. Um, it's terrific. It's amazing to see what you're doing and what you've got going on. Um, let's jump into the challenges dentists are facing, right? Mm -hmm. So clearly you talk to a lot of people, right? You're all over the place. You're nationwide. Um, Melissa, what are some challenges and problems that you're seeing uh, dental practices and their teams facing today? That is, that is a big, a big question. And it, you know, it's, it's easy to answer it in, in kind of a, a word that I talked about earlier, just tradition. Dentistry is a very, very traditional, closed, small society, really. And so I think many of the problems right now can be, uh, kind of find their way back to this traditional mindset that practice owners have, that dental clinicians have, that even brand leaders have in dentistry, where the old way of doing things will make us succeed. The old ways of marketing, word of mouth, paper, you know, postcards in the mail, the old ways of doing things are going to make us succeed. And right now we're at a point, especially after COVID, after the shutdown, after this identity crisis that the dental industry had last year, um, we're at a point where that no longer will suffice. Um, so it's almost like dentistry is, it's, you, you have to get with the program now if you want to succeed in the future. Um, and I, I think we're going to see that, you know, for a while now, we've been anticipating that the American dental industry will be seeing some changes. So for a while now, we've been talking about Oh, once the millennials become the rise of their workforce and the decision makers in dentistry, we'll start to see some changes. Once, um, once more women graduate from dental school than than men, we'll start to see some changes. And and those things happen just over the last year or two. And so it's it's really time. Plus COVID, it's really it's kind of all the stars are aligning, and it's now like okay. It's time to get with the program. It's time to update our business models, update our workflows, work on work uh, employee wellness and team culture and delivering care, going out and meeting the patient where they are instead of coming in. And so 
So the problem, Patrick, is is really this traditional mindset of we graduate from dental school thinking the old ways are going to work and and we're used to doing it alone. And so if we can shift our mindset as practice owners, as clinicians, as leaders in the industry, if we can shift our mindset and say, okay, the old ways of doing things are not going to work anymore. It's 2021. We're going to get with the program. And that's the problem right now because there are so many practice owners who are just, you know, at the bottom of Maslow's hierarchy, just trying to get back into the swing of things. And they're missing the opportunity to, to really harness this change. So, Melissa, tell me what's an old way of doing things that's still commonly done today that you don't think it's going to survive? <laughs> that you think the faster you dump this tradition, oh expecting that your patients will be. Yeah. Expecting the patient to walk through your practice door. That is the one thing that is going to um, be the downfall of our industry. Once what I've found in my work with mobile dentistry and teledentistry and virtual care, what I found is that when, when a practice owner starts to think outside of the four walls of their practice, it's, it's so cliche to say this, but the opportunities are endless. And can you imagine the no-show rates, the decrease in the no-show rates? Like you don't have to, as when I was working clinical, I remember that the, the dentist many times would just be like sitting there in his office, holding his breath, breath, hoping that the, you know, three, the patient who was blocked off for three hours and is going to make a buttload of, of money off that day, hoping they showed up. Right. And can you imagine taking that care to the patient? It, it eliminates that, that fear and that, that mistrust of the patient. But I think what we saw over COVID-19 was a lot of dental practices began to experiment with virtual care. So even if it was just using Zoom or FaceTime or texting their patient, sure. they started to realize, oh, like this does work. There are other ways where I can have a patient touch point without having them walk through my front door. And so that was kind of the gateway for these dental practice owners to think beyond the four walls of their practice. Now, I've seen some in the talk to dentists say like, it doesn't work. I tried it and it doesn't work. And of course, you know, if I went and tried to cook, bake some cookies, or if I tried to make chocolate chip cookies in a pot of boiling water, that's not going to work either, <laughs> right? So oftentimes when things don't work, it's because we're literally not following a recipe or a or following steps towards success to make these things work, to make teledentistry work, for instance, or remote health or whatever, whatever you want to call that. What are some steps that they need to take that most are not taking? Mm hmm well, for virtual care in particular, the way we saw most clinicians use it was the live FaceTime chat, which is great. It's what, you know, it's it's live video. It's it's great. It's a useful tool. But I think an action step for practice owners who are frustrated right now, who have used it and said, this isn't for me, the action step would be to... I would say dig in deeper, connect with me, connect with, with the conference that I run. I wrote a book. We have a podcast every Monday called Dentistry Gone Wild, where we actually dive into use cases of, of you know, successful uses of this. Um, one of the misnomers with virtual care is that um, the best way to use it is, is, is the live FaceTime. And that's actually the, not the best way to use the, the teledentistry aspect. There's a, there's a, a type of teledentistry called store and forward teledentistry. It's called asynchronous teledentistry. And that's the secret sauce to, to virtual care. And it's, it's this, it's a secret still. Nobody, nobody knows, you know, really yet that that's what is the case. And so, once dental practice owners and clinicians start to use the asynchronous parts of teledentistry, then they'll realize, okay, this is much more flexible. This is much more useful. Sure. So, so what we've been seeing is there are some dentists who had a backlog of hygiene patients, um, you know, since they were shut down for six months. And so what they did was instead of getting up during their crown prep four times to go do hygiene checks, they would let the hygienist have the in-person visit with the, with the patient. And then at the end of the day, the dentist would go through all their records, go through all the, the intraoral scans and intraoral photographs and, and go through all the records and do the hygiene checks then sure. asynchronously. And that, that helped a lot of them um, get caught up on their hygiene checks. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I could actually see that as something that ends up being outsourced. 
um, yeah. right? Someone being able to review those. Well, you can have, or if you think about it, if you have, if you have three full-time dentists that are employed for you and you only have room for two, right? And they run a rotation. Somebody can work from home one day a week or mm -hmm. an hour a day and review these. So I can see a lot of opportunity there. Um, I want to encourage our audience to check out a couple of things. Check out um, your conference. It's N M D conference. Um, dot com. A lot of information out there. What are some other um, what are some other websites and organizations you'd recommend um, that our users check out uh, pursuing uh, moving into the late 2020s? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would suggest um, if you're if you're on Facebook anymore, I know there's a lot of people that are moving off of Facebook, but if you still are on it, I would I would suggest joining my iHeart mobile dentistry group. Just search it in Facebook. Um, if you're interested in knowing how and, and what the delivery of healthcare or virtual care can do for you, you'll find it all. You'll find it all in this group. Um, and it's just a, a great, a great place to go. Um, and you could just find me on Instagram too. That's where my fun side really comes out to play. You can find me at the tooth girl, the tooth girl, at Instagram at the tooth girl. Melissa, thank you so much for coming on today. We really appreciate it. We love what you're doing, and we're so thankful that you answered that ad. Um, Melissa Turner, nmdconference.com. Um, please check it out. Melissa, thank you for coming on today. Thank you, Patrick. Thank you for joining us on today's episode. Did you know you can weigh in on today's topic on Facebook? Search The Dental Brief on Facebook or visit our website, dentalbrief.com, and just follow the link. We look forward to having you join us again on another episode of The Dental Brief.